It was war. And when I say this, I mean every morning I'd get up and I would go out to our porch and I would pull out the gloves, the rubber boots, and every tool I could get my hands on, the fertilizer, anything that I could get, I would go to the garden. In those wee hours before my son would get up and all chaos would reign, and I would head out to try to fix things again. You know, they say that gardening is one of these things that's cheaper than therapy, but I needed therapy after this garden because here I was, every day of life, going out to battle. First, it was the bugs, the things that ate all the things I just planted. And then it was the tree roots, because hey, if you fertilize ground next to a tree, guess where the roots go? And then, when all was sorted, and this garden was finally good, and growing, and beautiful, then came this wretched little clover that would just worm its way into everything. And I had no idea what it was, but it was everywhere. And every night I would pull it from my garden and every morning, no, look, there's a little one right there and it's growing in its back. I had no idea what to do, but I was at the end of my rope. As leaders in our churches and our communities and our classrooms, we have to be mindful of our own health and wellness. We have to be careful to keep an account of how we're doing in the same way that I was trying to keep a careful account of how my garden was doing. Today, we're going to be talking about just one indicator that we're headed in the right direction, our ability to empower others. Let's dive into scripture, because it's always best when we start there and we can understand what it is that God is telling us from his word. We'll be reading from Exodus, chapter 18, verses 13 through 26. And I have the New Revised Standard Version. Again, it's Exodus 18, 13 through 26. The next day, Moses sat as judge for the people. And while the people stood around him from morning until evening, when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing, he said, what is it that you're doing for these people? Why do you sit alone? Why are all the people standing around you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God? When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make known to them the statutes and the instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, what you're doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people. The task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel, and God be with you. You should represent the people before God, and you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions, and make known to them the way that they are to go and the things that they are to do. You should look for able men among all the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy, and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers in the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, and the tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you, but decide every minor case themselves. So it will be much easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their homes in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, as officers to thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor case they decided themselves. Blessed be the reading of God's word this morning. May it teach us that we learn and grow. 
Moses had led the people from Egypt, okay? We've made it through the river that has divided. They got across. The Egyptians are no longer on their heels. They've seen God provide manna. They've seen a rock split open and water came out. And now comes the hard part. How do you lead this many people when they've had everything decided for them for so long? How do you lead a nation that still doesn't have its feet underneath them? Moses decides to lead by being so hands-on that literally every decision comes to him about the community. Every grievance between two people whose tents are next to each other and suddenly one child knocks over someone else's manna bowl and oh no, Moses has to sort it out. All these grievances between, well, that was my pot. I think you took my pot. Every little thing. Now, we don't see what these details are, but I imagine that a lot of them were pretty trivial. And Moses probably didn't have to be in the middle of them because there were thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. That's a lot of deciding for one person to do. Why did Moses choose to lead in this way? Everyone seems to notice, except for Moses, that it's not really working. In fact, at this point, Moses doesn't even have his wife and children with him. The burden was so great that Moses is just here on his own. And his father-in-law sees and hears about what's going on, and what does he do? He brings Moses' family back to him and says, Listen, son, we have to talk. I would have loved to see how that conversation happened. And I would love to see what Moses' wife was looking like in the background, waiting for her father to tell him just what's what now. But why would Moses choose to act in this way? What led him to lead in this way? When we look at history, we can see some indications for why Moses may have chosen to lead like this. We can look at examples from Egyptian leadership and see that it was really quite common for the person who was the intermediary of God to also mediate in cases and judicial disputes. The high priest of Egyptian cults was often someone who would just oversee cases throughout the day. And yes, they were the high priest over these religions, but their primary function as mediator was also to mediate judicial things. They were government, they were faith, And here Moses is acting in the only role that he ever knew that might come close to the role he's in because, yeah, he was raised in an Egyptian household. He didn't have a lot of experience with Yahweh until suddenly God tells him, you're going to lead these people. And so he tries. And he takes what he has learned and he applies it in the best way that he knows. And the best way that he knows is do it all. Jethro came and saw this, and said, there's got to be a better way. Not, you're doing it wrong. There needs to be someone overseeing this. But how can we make it better? Healthy leaders empower others. Healthy leaders empower others. We can come and we can learn and we can grow and take every book that we've ever been handed and learn amazing insights. But if we never pass these amazing insights to others, what is the use of learning them? What is the use of coming and growing as a leader if you're not willing to help others grow behind you and come up with what you've learned? Moses saw this model of Egyptian leadership, and here he stepped in and came to understand about God and was influenced still by what he had been raised in. The things that Moses had learned in Egypt just didn't disappear after he came to know who God was. He was still impacted by everything he had been raised in his understanding of leadership. And there was nothing wrong with that. There were some helpful things that he had learned. Overseeing cases instead of just letting people street brawl in the middle of the wilderness. It was important to have this role. But, as Jethro pointed out to him, it can be done better. Healthy leaders empower others. We don't just try to take the burden on ourselves. While I was out in the garden, 
digging, fighting, at war, our backyard is connected to a number of other yards. And one of these other yards contains a house full of children who are very well versed in everything outdoors. Several of them are involved in scouts and things like that, but all of them have an aptitude for everything outdoors. Now, when it comes to athletic things, I'm not, absolutely not inclined that way, but I like to think I know what I'm doing with gardening. And so, the little miss from next door comes over, and she sees me pulling out this weed, and she gets really excited, because to her, this isn't a weed, this is dinner. She loves this plant. It's her favorite. And she's so thrilled that I knew enough about it to pull it out of the garden and take it in the house to get it ready to use for lunch. And I was like, I could play this off. It's like, yes, yes, I am taking this inside. Yes, I am going to eat this for lunch. But then I thought, you know, <laughs> that terrible phrase from the 90s, what would Jesus do here? And I realized, you know, Jesus probably wouldn't lie to the nine-year-old neighbor girl. And so I was like, no, Addie, actually, I didn't know. What, what is this plant? Is it, it's safe to eat? And without any warning, she rips a huge chunk off the plant and shoves it in my mouth. And I'm like, oh my goodness, COVID. And then second, I was like, what is this plant in my mouth? And third, I was like, man, this tastes just like lemons and it is delicious. And I, you know, proceed to eat this plant hesitantly while she begins to rattle off all of the medicinal and cooking properties of this herb. And if you dry it out, it loses its flavor. And she goes on and she lists all these incredible things about this plant. And I'm still chewing like, it's safe, right? <laughs> and so here I am, just kind of like shock and awe because that's what I was trying to do to this plant, ripping it out of the ground and getting rid of it. And here comes this wonderful little girl who comes to me and says, but wait, it has value. It has potential if you use it right. I think of the time that <laughs> we were starting in a new church and we were starting a youth ministry and we had no workers. We walk into the situation and it's just my husband and I, and yeah, both of us have been youth pastors before, but this is a whole different ball game because now we have two different cultures coming together in one youth group and one side of the youth group only speaks Chinese and the other side of the youth group only speaks English and we have to put them together in one group and we have no idea how we're really going to manage that with no people and just two of us who neither of us speak Chinese. And so the only person who came to us and says, yeah, I'd love to help out, just tell me how I can help out was a 75-year-old woman who clearly is not up for dodgeball. And like, let's face it, youth ministry, a lot of times, that's our go-to. And she just really didn't fit the mark of what we were looking for. But you know what? In that moment, when she volunteered, we had the sense, both of us, say yes. And so we did. And we spent the rest of the week trying to figure out, oh, Lord, what are we going to do with Jackie? We loved her to pieces, but how do we bring a 75-year-old woman into that setting? How can you empower someone who's clearly very frail to come and be a part of something that's not necessarily built for frail people? And so she came to youth group. And we found spaces and places that she just naturally inserted herself. And the kids who were withdrawn and quiet were suddenly connecting with Grandma Jackie. She had an ability to speak into the lives of these children that none of the rest of us had any power to. And so as we had other leaders come in, Miss Jackie, our Grandma Jackie, filled in in ways that we never had the chance to. We never had the foresight to but Grandma Jackie did. And on nights that none of us knew anything was going on, she'd show up with a box of cookies and say, I just felt like I needed to bake these, and obviously someone would have needed them. And so, while the rest of us played games, the student that she had been praying for that week and felt impressed to bake these cookies for would sit with Grandma Jackie and tell her all about what was going on. Healthy leaders empower others. We give others the chance to step into roles that maybe we don't foresee them doing well in, but God's given them a burden for. 
healthy leaders empower others. This takes a couple of things on our part to be able to do this. We need to have awareness of what our people are capable of, and not just our impressions of what they're capable of, but an understanding of their actual skills, talents, abilities, and don't dismiss passions. Jackie didn't know what she was going to do at youth group, but when she heard that we needed people, she was immediately impressed. God wants me there, and I am passionate about seeing God's kingdom grow with teenagers. So I'm coming, but I have no idea why. And she confessed this to us. She's like, my only skill is cookies, and I'm not that fast. So I'll just bring cookies and sit. And that was one of the most powerful things that we ever had. Healthy leaders empower others by being aware of them and giving them space to dream that there is a space for them in God's kingdom, that there is a place for them to do God's will in some way that may never see for themselves. Don't let your fear of them failing keep you from empowering them in the first place. Don't let your apprehension that, you know, they're maybe not strong enough as a Christian to take on this role yet. We'll just give them a, a little more space, a little more time. And every time we find ourselves thinking these things, remind yourself that when the master left the three servants at home with piles of money, he trusted all three of them, knowing that the one with the least money may not succeed. But he still trusted him with the gifts and talents to see what they could do with them. As we give people more and more responsibilities, they will grow into them or we can take a step back and give them more time. But don't shy away from the risk of doing it in the first place. Because as leaders, we need to empower others in order to see that mark of healthiness in our own lives. I'm going to admit here, and I think I already have, that when Addie shoved that plant in my mouth, there was a real big red flag going off, like, this is risk. This is a huge risk. What am I doing? Spit it out. But I trusted her because this nine-year-old wonder kid had the ability to see what this plant was when all I saw this plant, which apparently is called sorrel, was some kind of wretched little clover. She saw what I couldn't. And by empowering her to share the knowledge she had with me, I learned about a great new thing, something that I love and enjoy now. And I also found out it was really good for the potatoes that it was growing all around. It made my potatoes grow deeper, which made them grow bigger, which is wild, I know. Don't totally understand it, but it made them better. And it made the sorrel better. Everything won because I was willing to take that risk. Healthy leaders empower others. It's not without risk, but are you willing to take it?